All right, there's actually a lot of things, and I, I know at least one of the boxes, its contents are not anime or anime related or even DVD related, but I just figure, let's just get these things open. And trying to be careful, okay. Yeah, I kind of thought this one would be a one DVD thing. This one is an anime, if I can get this. I can go the way and make sure. But this one, this one is not. Oh geez, it's a little heavy. You've actually seen me get this before. You just never expected to just see it again. That's right. I discovered that the um, Rex Tiny Conversation Hearts two pound baggers are still. Boot and a boot. So I got a couple bags. And this should be the remainder of the stuff that arrived today. And, uh, let's see. Oh, what a piece of crap. Let's get those scissors back out and just. I do this, do this anyways for the plastic one. This is a one-off, and I do believe this one is not anime. This is Secret of Nim Family Fun Edition, which I already have the Secret of Nim, but the version I have is not the Secret or the Family Fun Edition, and it's uh, full screen only. So I do believe, based on review, uh, in-depth review, that this specific version should give me my widescreen version of it. Uh, I see a thing there that says widescreen. And it also has the full screen version. But I did that recently for the Land Before Time. I figured Secret of Nim was actually worth the effort as well. Okay, this one's actually just opening, so I have to put these scissors aside before I poke someone's eye out. And in here, if I could just get this open the rest of the way. We got a lot of DVDs, and it feels like uh, two SanDisk things, which um, are something else and won't be discussed any further on this update. And if you think that's everything, well, we are also missing um, Save the Moon. This one actually should have arrived last week. It's just, I guess. Well, when you pay for the um, slower shipping, I guess that means, oh, we're going to give it to the new guy, and sometimes he puts the thing destined for Austin to go to Alabama. So this went to Dallas, which is really close to Austin, only three hours away. Then it went to Alabama, then it went to Denver, then it came back to Dallas, and then it finally came here. Uh, since I ordered from Right Stuff, it came with uh, this coin. Say the moon, Viz Media, Moon Crisis, make up. And you may think that's everything, but there's uh, other non-anime stuff, because I, I had a birthday recently, and my friend got me Animaniacs Volumes 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you might have noticed there's a foil essence shade here. This is actually good tradition, a fun tradition, where um, back when I was assembling decks out of everything I could make, one of my best decks was a black um, resurrection deck, you know, discard a card, bring it to life. And Issen's Shade was one of the creatures from there. And one of the things we did over the years was take that deck of completely all over the place random cards and make foil versions. Now, there's this. I've made an improved version since then. I, maybe I've talked about it. But, you know, that one's still good for the old deck. Oh well, let's get to anime stuff and begin with Sailor Moon Super... Is it, is it Super S or Supers? Hmm. I'm not going to think too much more about it. I'm just going to take this off. And you know, this is pretty, very in line with all the other Sailor Moon new releases. See, I guess we didn't look at the back. Region A only. It should be English dubbed, and I do believe it's a 
completely new dub English stereo and Japanese audio I'm trying to think what that means if it's if it's English stereo and Japanese whatever anyways um, we've got three discs let's see did I determine I see that blu-ray thing there so it's 123, 128 through 146. And then this should be DVDs. Yeah, I see DVD there. I think it's kind of the same thing, except I, I like the line art on that one better. This one's kind of neat. The white on background, but I don't know. That's a lot sharper. That one's okay, but I think that first one is kind of the winner. That is, or I guess it is the same there. It's just the reverse color thing can make it kind of tricky to tell them apart or to distinguish the characters. And you can see the baddies, the circusy people. I don't remember what they were exactly called. Some circus thing. I remember they were looking for that. Pegasus. You know, just going through that real quick, I saw that there was a lot more text than imagery, which is nice. You know, it means there's descriptive stuff. Let's see, next up we have this mysterious thing called Mobile Suit Gundam Age. There we go. I was pretty sure there was a DVD version, uh, as well as this movie version. This is Sunrise Right stuff. So I guess this is, a uh, okay, DVD Region 1. We actually want to look at this. Because that says Blu-ray Region A, and I do believe that none of these say English dub. That's what I would expect, but then again, no, there's an English dub. Okay. I mean, I just didn't expect it, but I do believe Sunrise has continued English dubbing stuff. I think it's Sunrise that's been doing it. Because, like, even Japanese releases of, of new stuff are being dubbed, and... This thing is being an annoying piece of crap. Come on. Right. I'll be pulling plastic off this for many decades to come based on my experience from other things like this. Let's see if I can get all this plastic together in one bundle with uh, the sticker here. And open up the Blu-ray. Okay. I wonder what caused that. Is it like a subtle adhesive that's supposed to just be gone when the plastic is pulled off? Is it the power of the arts? The important thing is we've got that stuff off, and now we can take a peek. See a little thing that it says, uh, probably disc made in Mexico. Hecha in Mexico. I think we have a list of episodes, 26, 27, 28 episodes. That's actually quite a few. Kids. Actually, I'm trying to think if they remind me of kid versions of Mobile Suit Gun characters. I remember there being a blonde girl like that maybe in the very first one with that kind of red uniform. But then I don't recognize the green hair could be main guy, but could be something else completely. Probably main guy of this one if uh, he's on the first disc. If, I guess, Gundam... Yeah, that looks like the original Gundam, or does it? Maybe I just can't. I don't know if I can uh, recognize my mechas very well. I don't know what to think. Oh, well. We should take a peek in here to see what's different. Maybe this is the same. 
I mean, this kind of feels like there's more image there, more arm showing. And those all look exactly the same. Okay. That's fine. You know, that's kind of what one of the interesting things about buying both is we get to see that. I think this one's probably this week's major release, uh, Mary and the Witch's Flower, which, even though it looks like it's Studio Ghibli, it's Studio Ponok film. I do believe this was um, created by people who uh, used to work with Studio Ghibli, which is why there's a lot of very similar looking kind of style and design. Although this is G-Kids, so I guess they get all the shebang, don't they? And... I don't know. I... I don't know if this one's actually good or not. I just heard people kind of be interested in it, if anything. Uh, let's see, what information can we tell from here? Uh, I see a blue thing there that probably says it was made somewhere. Made in Mexico. Okay. Where's region? Region, region, region. I see something here that says DVD. Oh jeez, I've seen that before. I saw a YouTube video where apparently it looks a lot like another logo out there. Huh. I'm not seeing an A. Or even a 1. Maybe these are off-spec DVD Blu-ray things. Okay, this DVD actually says one right there. And this Blu-ray... I don't see it saying anything anywhere. Is it possible that this Blu-ray isn't region locked? That sounds weird. Not impossible, but... Oh well. Let me see Apple, Amazon. I'm trying to remember who it was that put this together. Oh well. Doesn't really matter. That's a Mary and the Witch's Flower. Um, maybe y'all spotted something back here that said something, anything. Actually, this one's different, isn't it? I don't see where it says Region 1. You would think that would be an important thing. Oh well. Let's not get too hung up on that, and let's continue on to Naruto Shippuden DVD set 34. With a very stylized Naruto and Sasuke, which I think kind of makes sense based on where the series was, but I guess I can't comment too much more. I'm curious what will happen, but I suspect um, this one will be kind of slow and... Maybe not too eventful. Because it seems like it's in one of those states. But, you know, I might sing a different tune. Let's take a look at the not so, um, whatever insides. You know, just the simpler decorations, the non anime character designy things. Eh, there we go. DVDs, one and two. Nice and simple. And then, last but not least, we have Adam the Beginning. Which sounded... It rang something of a bell, so I don't know if I know the franchise enough or not. But I do believe this is Astro Boy. And that means this is a little out of season. What I mean by that is, traditionally, I think an Astro Boy series should be made every 20 years. You got the original Astro Boy that was made in the 1960s, and then you got the second series, which was made in the 1980s, and other ones that were made in the early 2000s. So, logically, we should have one made in 2020, the next one made in 2020. Looks like just Japanese with English subtitles, and Japan's greatest hero. And this might be interesting. I don't really know, but it is... I feel like I am completely out of the loop. I've only watched a little bit of Astro Boy. Maybe this strikes me as something that you probably don't need to have watched Astro Boy to appreciate or enjoy. But anyways, there's this week's anime DVD collection update. 
So let's start out by um, talking about non known Biore repeat. Not really sure what there is to say uh, about it. It was just a neat, enjoyable um, series. Because last week I talked about, I watched the episodes one through eight, so I finished off the last four episodes. Um, I think there was maybe one or two extra things in there, but I didn't explore those. It's just something I guess I don't always do with my DVD Blu-rays. I have them there in case I want to go and visit them, but I'm okay with just, you know, watching the series and moving on to something else and trying not to be in the middle of too many things, which obviously I am always in the middle of too many things, aren't I? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I'm not sure what to really say about it. I guess I was a little surprised that they had a character. I don't know if they ever told us her name. Or maybe there was... Because there was a voice actor or actress who was always credited, but their character was all question marks. And I don't know what I missed that was going on there, because I guess I have trouble keeping track of the characters outside the main characters for this. Maybe? Eh, I don't know. Really, the more important thing was the other thing I watched, which was um, all of Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. And it, well, I was going to say it lived up to expectations, but I'm trying to think if I had expectations. All I knew was a pink little girl there, the gothic Lolita, was the most popular character out and about when this series aired. And regarding that, I was actually very surprised that as strong of a, of a character as she is, she didn't overshadow the other characters in the show. And that's what I usually tend to see. I think a good example may be um, Engaged to the Unidentified. I don't remember its Japanese name, but uh, Mashiro Tan from that kind of overshadowed a lot of the characters and her cute shenanigans kind of almost became the draw of the show. And the show kind of knew that. Where the other characters weren't bad, but she was kind of the fun one. And that's an interesting difference with uh, Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. Uh, in particular, um, the characters are pretty much all fun, neat, and interesting. If anything, um, Lukua and maybe Elma are a little less, but... Not not in such a way that they should be removed from the anime. It's more with Lukua, and I don't even remember if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, they kind of had this sort of gag going on that worked, but I wasn't quite sure how committed to the general idea it was trying to be. Because... It switched to... It, it's kind of switched things and mixed things up. It was weird. It's mostly an issue of hard to get a read on her and just what she was doing, but she was fun. And otherwise, Elma was a little less explored. When it came to pretty much every other character, I mean, the person whose name isn't the title but isn't the title character, because the title character, uh, the title is Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, so obviously it's referring to Toru because she'd be the title of character because she was Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. Toru was actually very fun. The show, it, it does a really good job of not making her feel too pushy. You kind of understand where she's coming from, this kind of slightly animalistic side. It, I've been having fun with Dragon Girl gifts all week, not only from this, but also from Chika. And she doesn't come off as too pushy, which pretty much means the series does a really good job of throwing these weird curveballs at us every once in a while, but I guess it's because Miss Kobayashi, the person whose name is in the title, She's a really great character. She's a fun character. First of all, obviously I'm biased because she's clearly some sort of um, software developer, engineer, QA. I'm not quite sure because her first line was talking about running integration tests against code and developers can do that. But if you have a company who separates the developer QA roles, then sometimes that means um, the QAs are writing tests like that and it's usually at an integration level. 
unit testing is possible, but um, I don't know. If, if y'all don't know the details, though why those separations could make sense is probably nonsensical. And now I think about it, she didn't seem to be doing much stuff that was um, QA specifically, so I think she was just a developer. And there are little hints at it that it's got some developer, software programmer nods to it. For example, if you, um, I think it, maybe it was the Hot Spring Extra episode, but in between certain scenes, it likes to throw show five dots and then have them um, revealed one at a time to kind of play with your mind a little bit. Sometimes they're showing a pattern or an idea or something, and two of them are the words foo and bar with, I think, opening and closing parentheses at the end. And if you're not a developer, that's generally the go-to example for, oh, let's just create a function with a name and the name isn't important, I'm just trying to show you how to create one. Usually the words foo and bar are the go-to to um, create that sort of stuff. And that's just a little thing. That's the sort of thing that even if you didn't know that, it shouldn't change how you enjoy the program or the show. Because Miss Kobayashi, regardless of what, whether you know what she's doing, you can kind of tell she's doing it really well. She's really respected by her peers, and she's really respecting of her peers. And that's just her and her workplace. When her, her interactions with other people is pretty great. I mean, she's a fun character, and she's the person whose name is in the title. And for the title of character, she works really well against her because even though Toru throws these weird curveballs every once in a while, Miss Kobayashi's reactions are perfect. They're not like over the top and making us feel unsure of this relationship. It's more like Miss Kobayashi is really in control of her life and that's kind of what Toru likes about her even if Toru challenges that sometimes and it comes together to make it feel like just their portion of the show is actually a fairly intimate relationship. Even though Miss Kobayashi isn't into dragons or girls, it's just enough to be very entertaining. And that's just their interaction. Um, Kana, I think part of the reason Kana is such a big character is because she's part of that dynamic as well. And I guess I'm not going to go into too much more detail about all that stuff because we're starting to deviate from ex uh, things that are definitely demonstrated in the first episode. But for the most part, um, I think Kana's really liked because she's a similarly... Um, what was that word I just used? Uh, I don't know. A, a very... There, there's an intimacy going on that mm, draws you in. I, and I watched the YouTube video where somebody was briefly talking about this. I think one of y'all might have sent me that video. And I didn't watch all of it because it was a long video and I don't remember what day that was. But um, he was talking about how relatable the characters are and how that's apparently something this author does and this author has another work, which I don't remember the name of, but I think it was the general pre premise it was something like my husband's the principal and I don't always understand or maybe something like that. And I'll be kind of keeping my eyes and ears out for something along those lines if that comes out on DVD Blu-ray because it sounds like that's probably pretty good in similar ways. Maybe not entirely because there's a lot about this that's actually entertaining beyond just this good, really well engineered slice of life interaction between the characters. I mean, okay, yeah, that's right, because Fefnir and all his stuff was just great, and that's one of the unfortunate things about this. So one unfortunate thing about this is Miss Kobayashi isn't on the front cover, and she's kind of an important character. The other is not all the dragons are on here, and Fefnir is actually really fun, and his interactions, they're very intimate in a different way, a slightly different way, but they work really well. Everything just works really well, and all the humor, it kind of pulls from a couple different things to keep you guessing, but it's not very unusual for the show to create a very intense, um, uh, I used to use this damn word a lot and I don't remember what it is, 
but a differential between oh there's this cutesy stuff and oh yes she's a dragon that's horrifying you know things like that which are just thrown at you curveball like that are really quite enjoyable and I think those actually help create a very strong impression in your mind because it's really clever with them and I don't remember if it ever stopped with them I don't know this was definitely a great series it's not gonna go on the box it's gonna go on the shelf of blu-rays in case I want to access it again and show it I mean I even showed my um, family the first episode and I guess I didn't pay completely close attention to my dad but I can guarantee that um, at least my mom and the brother that was there were both laughing at the appropriate moments and I think they appreciate the basic idea of the show that said they have to watch um, One Punch Man because apparently my parents haven't seen that and they've watched more Marvel Cinematic Universe stuff than I have I mean I've watched the movies I guess I should probably talk about Infinity War a little bit but uh you know when it comes to all the various series they've watched like all of them and I've only watched a couple seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and a couple episodes of Daredevil and it just feels like there's too much and I can't catch up ah but yes I did watch a, a, a Avengers Age or Infinity War and I'm not 100% sure where I sit on it it's definitely good it's definitely better than uh, Age of Ultron I think but it's hard for me to tell where exactly it is because, as you might expect from the most ambitious crossover since uh, ever, maybe, um, it's a little bit of a clusterfuck. But it's very interesting that even though there's all this stuff going on, for some reason, it's much more followable than other things out there. Like, I think uh, that's a complaint that's been leveled against the Amazing Spider-Man movies. That was two of them, right? And, you know, the original Spider-Man, I say original, but the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man trilogy, Spider-Man's 1, 2, and 3, kind of started getting more complicated, and Spider-Man 3 felt a little too complicated. And, you know, when you think about all that stuff and all these complications and what works and what doesn't work, for some reason, with Infinity Wars, it mostly works. And I say mostly because there are a couple of things which you can accept, or maybe I should say I had to accept, but I didn't feel that the movie had the um, breathing room to make me feel it, I guess, and I felt like it was trying, but unfortunately it's a very busy movie. and. Obviously, I want to see what happens after it. I think everybody who watches it does. But overall, it was enjoyable. One of the things that's probably... One of the most important things they probably did was in such a, a universe with such a wide variety of very powerful characters, they managed to make Thanos feel very dangerous. So... I'd have to say that if you wondered whether or not the build-up to him was good, I'd say it was. There are just a few story elements that slipped a little bit, and one of them, I actually had a small idea that if they had done that instead, it probably would have made the scene more impactful without really changing the length of it. And obviously I can't go into details here because that's super high spoiler. In fact, I'm kind of hoping I didn't spoil too much as it is. And I'm wondering if I drifted a little too much from my original thing of what exactly did I think about it? I thought it was, um, it wasn't as, oh yes, this is exactly what it needs to be as Avengers was, the first Avenger movie when they brought those five movies together into one. Right, somehow that worked out perfectly. This one, it... It feels like they've done a really good job of building up the universe and <clears throat> building up the ideas they've been building up and there were just a couple of swings that I, I, I guess we'll, we'll call them balls instead of strikes. You know, it's not quite as disastrous as a strike. It's not as exciting as constant hits. And it's kind of interesting because um, 
you, you kind of have to compare it to the recent adventure movies. And if you were wondering whether or not you need to see Black Panther, I would say you do. Um, in particular because uh, they do have the characters they introduced from Wakanda in Black Panther and you want to know who they are and why they are. And I kind of figured that was a likely possibility, but it was also one of those things where I could have seen it being something that they didn't have to, and so they didn't, but no, they made it the most ambitious crossover since Roger Rabbit, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which I don't know if it's more ambitious than that. Who Framed Roger Rabbit is pretty damn ambitious, but it pretty much means, yeah, yeah, you, you have to watch, I think you have to watch absolutely every Marvel Cinematic Universe movie before watching this because I think there's the accumulation of all these little things from all of them that came together in this. Some of them you probably already know. If you skipped any, um, I would say you probably have to watch it. You probably should watch it because they did a really good job of pulling all these ideas together. But I can't go into a lot of details on a lot of stuff, especially some of the smaller things because that's, you know, spoiler. Lots and lots and lots of potential spoilers there. <sighs> but yeah, it's kind of interesting because compared to the previous two, Black Panther was okay. I definitely rate Avengers Infinity War as better than Black Panther. But based on the people who like Black Panther and I don't understand why, other people out there might have a different opinion in that regard. For me, the problem with it was um, it kind of had this idea and unfortunately it interfered with the attempt to create a story or a narrative. Which is kind of interesting because when you think of the movie before that, Thor Ragnarok, well obviously that one's the best of the Thor movies, but I think I got a chance to rewatch that last week, did I even mention that? And it's interesting because they kind of did something different with that too and I thought that one actually worked. And I didn't say it last week, I guess the general idea is I was thinking that it's kind of like playing around with the human element in a way that I don't think I've seen a movie do before. Which would be hard for a lot of movies to do because I think it only works for Thor Ragnarok because of all the universe they've built up going up to that point. Where basically it plays with this idea that the people on the screen are perfect people. And you can kind of see this with um, just normal speech. I mean, I'm pr I can't think of any right now, but I'm pretty sure I've slurred some words while talking this. I maybe have said one thing and meant another thing. You know, real people making conversations make mistakes. And hopefully this video has actually been a really good example of that just because I don't edit it. And so if it's in there, then um, it's in there. But Thor Ragnarok is like, you know, in reality, people make mistakes all the time when they do stuff. Especially when they get extra ambitious. That's why famous last words, hold my beer, things like that. You know, that basically means somebody's about to do something silly and it's going to end up to be really dangerous. And they'll, we like to say they'll kill themselves, but really, you know, we're jokingly saying, haha, you pretty much killed yourself there, you silly idiot. So there's that kind of human element of mistakes which I think kind of permeates a lot of Thor Ragnarok is what the funness of that movie is about and it's very entertaining because they embraced that they made the movie pretty much about that and I think that's also why the villain felt a little underutilized when I rewatched it it actually seemed pretty fine she was a cool villain with a cool idea she felt like she didn't feel like she was just some afterthought. She just felt like she was being overshadowed by a funner idea in that movie. And in that regard, it means she serves her purpose as being a person we're curious about, a person we want to see what they're going to do, that we feel is legitimately threatening, and is a good motivation for the story to continue forward. While at the same time we're enjoying this humanization of all these characters. Or something like that? I don't know. I think I've drifted very far from talking about Infinity War. because, And I guess it's mostly because Thor Ragnarok is still a um, looming memory going into Infinity War. More so for me than Black Panther was. 
But fortunately, Black Panther wasn't too long ago, so I didn't... Well, I guess I can't say that I didn't forget any names because I didn't remember any names to forget. I can barely remember the name of the country, Wakanda, and I guess part of the problem is it sounds like a real country name, and so it tries to go into that geography part of my brain where it goes, oh, yeah, you're trying to do that again. <laughs> nope, we're not going to remember it. I mean, I, I think I even remember that uh, Zaire, the, you know, real, or maybe formerly real country changed its name. And I only remember that because of the most deadly strain of Ebola that happened there. That's how bad my geography is. I think I'm going on a complete tangent at this point. Uh, other stuff, other stuff. Uh, I did finally make do a little more work on my streaming server, and this time I had to deal with lazy loading exceptions with Hibernate, because apparently um, Spring Boot isn't able to manage transactions in a JMX thread. It's JMX, the right word. It's JMS, JMX, whatever. And so that basically meant that I was having trouble preserving IDs of stuff because I really want to be able to scan a disk and then maybe come back later and scan it again, maybe because I improved the way it scans stuff, and have it override what's in the database instead of um, completely replace it, which means that all the indexes are whatever I was indexing before are invalid. You know, updating is kind of nicer than replacing. Replacing contains a lot of headaches. And, you know, that's that lazy loading exception, that's a real problem that a lot of people run into. And depending on what you're trying to do, there's different solutions. And ultimately, I was able to finally find somebody who apparently ran into the same problem I did, which is when you try and um, do some lazy loading from within a JMS endpoint or function or whatever. Um, it, it, you can't do the lazy, the lazy loading. And I did try to switch it to eager loading if you're curious. And unfortunately, uh, it sounds like you can't do eager loading if it's eager loading too many things at once. And in this case, since this is a handbrake result, this means that uh, it would be for a single disk or for a single entry in the database, which represents a disk. There's going to be multiple tiles, and each tile is going to have multiple audio streams and multiple subtitle streams and multiple chapters. and I guess it just can't pull 13 billion things at one time that are all contained in one object. Which I guess I can't blame it. But, yeah, that was a painful problem. Uh, I have not made a whole lot of progress making my little RPG. Apparently, the artistic side of designing a unique town is still really slow. And I it doesn't help that I don't make a lot of progress focusing on it or something like that. There's all these other things. In fact, now I've got a project to eat all these candy hearts. I'll try not to do it in one day. I think I should uh, respect my taste buds a little bit more. But that's all the things. I think that's all the things. Yeah. So, y'all have a nice week.